Hi, welcome to the Melissa Copal Chocolate and Pastry School. I'm Andres Lara. Let's get into our basic sable recipe. For this, you're gonna need the following ingredients. T55 flour, icing sugar, room temperature butter, and sea salt. All right, to start, the very first thing we need to keep in mind is that the butter should be room temperature. And so a gauge for your room temperature butter, what's adequate is that it's basically pomade or it should be pliable just like this. So it shouldn't be melted and it shouldn't be too hard. Just nice enough that you could basically run the spatula through it and it's pliable enough. So we're gonna put our butter into the KitchenAid. And this is just kind of a really good, simple but handy, you can count on kind of sable recipe for either baking as cookies or lining tart shells. So we have our butter, we're gonna add our icing sugar, and we're using icing sugar here, remembering that icing sugar has a bit of starch, so that starch is gonna act like a binding, um, binding agent here. So hence, we don't have any eggs in this recipe. Now, something else I like to do, We've all kind of been taught and, and we practice that we should always add all of the flour at the end of the mix because we don't want to overdevelop the gluten, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, something I like to do in a lot of my doughs and even my cookies and cakes is oftentimes I'll take about 25% of the flour out of the mix from the end and I'll actually put that 25% at the beginning. And literally when I say 25%, you don't need to scale it. I'm just gonna do it by eye. So I kind of take a little bit of what I think 25% is with the spatula and this is gonna go in at the beginning of the mix. So the idea here is that by removing 25% of the flour from the end of the mix, right, we have 25% less chance to overdevelop gluten. Vice versa, that 25% of flour that's here at the beginning of this mix, remembering that flour has starch, is gonna help to it's basically gonna help you to realize a better emulsion, right? It's gonna act as a better binder. Now in this recipe, we have icing sugar, so we already have some starch. But in a lot of other recipes, you're gonna just be doing granulated sugar, plus you're gonna have the addition of eggs and maybe any other fats. So this is especially helpful in these kinds of scenarios. So again, that 25% of the flour at the beginning with your butter and your sugar. Sea salt as well, it's one of those ingredients, or any salt for that matter, that it doesn't really matter where you put it, it's there for seasoning, and a little bit of color, but more so for seasoning. So I just tend to put it at the beginning of my recipes, whether it's in the sugar, or with the dry solids, or with the liquid, but I like to get it out of the way just so that I don't forget it. Now we're gonna do the first part of the mix for about 60 seconds, so about a minute or so, on low speed. There's no need to incorporate a lot of air into this. We're not making a cheesecake or anything. All right, so a nice 30 to 60 seconds. This is a small quantity, so I'll probably go a little bit less than 60 seconds, but if you're doing a large batch, you could do a good even minute, maybe scraping in between. All right, this looks good. So now we just scrape down the sides. We'll add the rest of our flour. And now we're just gonna mix until it's combined. Depending on your KitchenAid or on your mixer, my first speed tends to be a little bit fast here, so usually when I add dry solids at the end, so typically flour, I like to kind of just pulse it to start, and then I just gently combine it. Especially if you have a large quantity of, of a recipe for, for the KitchenAid, you might be kind of at the limit, so in order to avoid making a mess, you might want to be careful and just kind of pulse it a couple times to start to get the dry solids incorporated, and then you can finish it on first speed. All right, I see that this is starting to combine. We're gonna stop. I can check by hand if there's any undissolved flour. I can mix it in either with a scraper, with my glove, or with a spatula, but it's better to stop a little before you think it's done as to not risk over mixing. But it looks like we've done a pretty good job here. Again, a really simple recipe. 
if you wanted to possibly include a little bit of nut flour, for example, you could replace uh, anywhere from 5 to 10% of the icing sugar for the nut flour. And this is nice if you want a little bit more flavor development. Um, for this kind of scenario, what I usually recommend is, for example, if you're going to use an almond flour, is to roast your almond flour beforehand. Low and slow is my rule of thumb. So around 150 to 160 Celsius, which is about 315, 320 Fahrenheit. Uh, roasting the nut flour, so almond flour, hazelnut flour, whichever flour it may be, mm, perhaps eight to 10 minutes, but really you're gonna need to use your senses. So when it starts to look good, when it smells good, if it, if it looks and, and smells good to you, obviously you're not gonna taste the nut flour, um, but n roasted nuts you would taste. So if it tastes good, smells good, and looks good, it's probably gonna be good in the recipe. So just use your judgment and use your senses as, as a chef, as a cook. Let it cool down and then you can scale it for your dough. And, and by developing more flavor in your nut flour, you're gonna develop even more flavor in your final product, whether it's a, a simple sable or a cookie or a travel cake. And it's, I always say that it's the little things that make you stand out compared to everybody else or every other shop that you might have in your city or in your neighborhood. So we just scrape, make sure there's no undissolved solids. It looks good. I'm just gonna take some plastic wrap. We're gonna make a little, a little square, a little book of our dough. And we're gonna put this in the refrigerator to rest for at least three to four hours, if not overnight. make yourself a little square rectangle so you have a good starting point for when you need to sheet it out or roll it out by hand. Now in terms of working with your dough, I'm a big fan and advocate of always allowing your dough to rest in cold, so in the refrigerator, right? So I would never go from making the dough to right away rolling it out and then, I mean, of course you would, you would not even be able to cut it. So let this rest in the refrigerator, preferably in production you're going to be making larger quantities so you can organize yourself to make it on day one, and then the next day you could come in and roll it out. So it would be making your dough, allowing it to rest in the refrigerator, then rolling it out by hand or sheeting it on a sheeter, then allowing it to rest again, cutting it out, then resting one last time, and then from there, you can decide if you wanna bake it, if you need to bake it, or if you're just loading up on mise en place. And that's how I would personally do it uh, if I was doing production. I would basically get to the point where I cut everything out in whatever portions I'm doing, whether it's for lining tarts, or for cookies, or for decorations, etc. and then from there, freeze it. So at that point, the only thing you have left to do, either the night before or the morning of, is take the dough out and bake it, because it's already cut down to size. So now that our sable dough has had a few hours to rest in the refrigerator, we can roll it out. So of course in production, you would probably want to scale up and do this in a sheeter. I'm going to do this by hand, it's a very small uh, quantity. One suggestion I do have though, and I think this is kind of a lifesaver, if you don't have a sheeter and you are doing this consistently or in constantly um, by hand for, for example, um, in a restaurant setting or, or just in a cafe or even a hotel if you just don't have a sheeter. Uh, I suggest getting a rolling pin like this. Um, this is one that we get from Mad Fair. But what's really interesting here is that these sides are adjustable. And they come in a set of, I think, almost 10 to 12 different uh, measurements. So I can put these on here, whatever size I want. And right now I grab three mm. So since I have a three mm measurement on each side, I'm gonna just use kind of the, the weight of the rolling pin and the measurements are already set for me. So this is gonna roll this out to three mm for myself. And this is a really good way to basically get a consistent product every time by hand. Because when you roll with a rolling pin, a traditional rolling pin, as good as you might be, you, it's not gonna be perfect, 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 right? So this ensures consistency throughout your production. So I'm just gonna roll this out, the sable. We're not gonna do anything fancy with the sable. We're just gonna sheet it out and then um, cut it into little sables and bake them. Of course, you could do whatever you want with this in whatever size or shape you'd like. I'm doing this in acetate right now just because I want you to be able to see through for the camera. Uh, in production though, you could do this in silpats, between silpats, or uh, between baking or parchment paper. And the same thing goes for when you're sheeting this out on the, or rolling it out on the sheeter. I typically do it between baking paper on the sheeter. All 
All right, so I can already feel that I'm getting close just by the height of the table and the rolling pin. And I love this because it's very even and I don't have to think about it. I don't need to keep checking because the rolling pin is going to do all the work for me. Also a great way to stay clean. You're not putting the dough directly on the table and you're not getting the rolling pin dirty as well. And of course you don't need to add any flour, which is great. All right, one more little roll here. Looks pretty good. So now we're going to go back in the refrigerator or chiller uh, at least another hour to rest. I'm always, I mentioned this at the beginning when we were making the dough, I'm a big fan of allowing refrigeration or cold in between every step. So it means making the dough, allowing it to chill in the refrigerator for at least a couple hours, if not overnight. After rolling it, at least another one to two hours in the fridge, and then we can cut and bake or we can cut and store in the freezer. So I'll see you in about an hour and we'll cut and get ready to bake some sablés. So it's been about an hour, hour and a half. Our dough has had some time to relax in the refrigerator. So all I'm doing now is essentially cutting out whatever shape, whatever size I want. Just doing a couple here as an example. I have my oven set at about 320 Fahrenheit, which is roughly uh, 150, 160 Celsius. And you're just kind of, I, like, I prefer baking low and slow. So we're just gonna bake these so they have a nice golden color. Um, depends on your oven. In ours, it'll probably be about, I'd say six to nine minutes, give or take. And that's it. It's just an example of, uh, of the dough and obviously you're free to do with it um, whatever you'd like. It makes a really nice kind of sable base for a cake. It could be a nice uh, sable cookie sandwich. Um, it can be a nice fonçage for a tart. Uh, it's just a good, easy, workable recipe to have in your repertoire. So let's put this in the oven and we'll take a look when they're out. So here we have it, our sablés just came out of the oven about two, three minutes ago. I passed them over to a little wire rack to cool down. And that's it, nothing to it, really simple. A uh, little sablé basis for sandwiches, uh, base for a petit gâteau or to build a tart on top of, etc. Just a good simple recipe to have in your repertoire amongst all your base recipes. I hope you found this recipe useful. I hope it becomes a staple in your repertoire and you can find a variety of uses for it. It is very versatile. So again, you could do a sable sandwich, you could use it as a tart base uh, or even as a petit gâteau base. So on behalf of everybody here at the Melissa Copel Chocolate and Pastry School, I wish you a wonderful day.